Thank you very much, James. Um, it's wonderful to be with you all again. Uh, and uh, this final session, we're going to be, I think, quite um, helpfully finishing up the, the, the week morning of sessions, thinking about uh, reaching out and why and how. Uh, and um, Debs is actually going to be doing the majority of this session. Debs uh, is a church community worker in Greater Manchester, uh, and she's essentially set up a, 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 an interchurch befriending uh, um, that seemed to be a charity initiative that, that she'll tell you all about and she's passionate about the role of the bible uh, and how we can really in encourage valuing older people um, as we look at them as the lord does she's also studying for a ba in third age mission and ministry uh, and what's really helpful about um, our professional engagement is that faith and later life uh, seeks to provide um, support and equipping uh, to people on the front line like yourself and like deb's uh, and, uh, and then we see how, uh, you know, uh, older people are impacted by the gospel and by the love of people in their local churches. So, um, Kate, could you share the slides, please? Thank you. And if we just go to the next one. Oh. Just to the next page. That would be fab. Thank you. So, um, as I said, Faith and Native Life, the organisation that I lead, we, we seek to support and equip Christians such as yourselves in your church contexts uh, uh, who are ministering with older people. You might be doing that on your own, you might be heading up a befriending ministry like Deb's, uh, but we seek to in enable and encourage you. We can't do that on our own as a, as a small charity. And the reason uh, I wanted to start this session was just to uh, set out the importance of that partnership working. Uh, you know, engaging and working with churches and with Christians all over the UK and even beyond uh, because actually it's that loop uh, means that we can work better together um, and of course the reasons why we do this as I mentioned if you were in my talk yesterday our why is critical because that informs our how um, and the reasons why we want to do these things of course are ultimately in God's word uh, we know that the Lord Jesus died for all of us irrespective of our age of course we also know that God has plans for older age uh, and we see that verse at the bottom of the slide in Psalm 92 uh, which talks about older Christians still bearing fruit so we want older people to know the Lord Jesus because we want them to know the wonderfulness of, of, of knowing him and being in relationship with him uh, and uh, and being able to look forward to heaven but also because we know that older people bring such value to our churches and beyond uh, but then also society uh, doesn't have the right view of older people uh, and that's demonstrated in the way so many older people are lonely isolated and feel out of touch and the last thing I want to say uh, to encourage us before we hear from how uh, Debs gets to grips with what she does and, and how perhaps you could join us at Faith and Native Life uh, and enable us to support you um, in a recent survey, uh, it was uh, it was said that 80 percent of older people in England and Wales, uh, and I don't know why it missed out Scotland and Northern Ireland, but that's the only statistic I had. 80 percent uh, would uh, identify as Christian. Now, of course, that doesn't mean they're Christian necessarily, but it means they have that uh, almost that undercoat of knowledge or interest. There's an open door there with older people to share the Lord Jesus. Uh, and so um, we love to partner with people like Debs with local churches. Uh, in moving the gospel out and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with older people. So that's all I'm going to say now, and I'll come and speak to you again at the end. And um, so next slide, I think, and I'm going to hand over to you, Debs. Thank you, Carl. And yeah, thank you for this privilege. Um, a little bit more about my background. So I started eight years ago as a community worker at the church uh, that I'm based at in East Manchester in a small village, um, with a focus on reaching out to older people in the community. Um, at the time, I was a youth worker, though, before I went into that role. So it's it, much thanks to the leadership in the church, really, recognising both a part for older people, my granddad being my best pal growing up and giving me a great admiration and respect for older people. And also God doing a real breaking on my heart as well with issues around isolation and loneliness. So, yeah, it started as a youth and community worker role and then developed into full time community. And now I'm actually funded part time by a social housing foundation to develop the befriending project which I'll explain a little bit more uh, soon but working two days a week for the church still with the community work so I want to start by really building on the why question um, still and just bring in a couple of other factors so you can see on the screen this report from the telegraph from a few years back now but it's identifying family breakdown 
um, as, as being at the root of uh, so many of Britain's problems, but it's specifically pointing out about loneliness amongst older people as well. So it highlights the people who over 75 will have spent Christmas Day on their own, but may have been, you know, may have family, but not been with them. So it talks about the fractures that we see in society there. And apparently the UK boasts some of the highest global rates of family breakdown. So I think that's an important factor to consider. Budget cuts, Keith was talking about this, referenced it on Tuesday, that society doesn't know how to fund or care for an ageing uh, society. And I want to pick up on this thing of ageism. Um, if you really want to go to town in, in understanding ageism, I recommend Louise's book, What's Age Got to Do With It? Um, but I want to pick up on something specifically around how we've dehumanised age and how there's this deeply embedded societal narrative um, that's fueling ageism, where our value is placed on our independence, our contribution and our cognition. And we see this played out in perhaps our own perceptions around ageing and how we view the other, but also I see this within older people and how they're viewing themselves. So I'll tell you in the last eight years, it breaks my heart to say the number of conversations I've had with older people who have basically said, I shouldn't be here. I'm a burden on my family, my friends, the state. Um, if there's a way out, I'd take it. And I feel this is a really important thing to be discussing because even this week, there are conversations happening in the Houses of Parliament around assisted suicide. It's a conversation that keeps pounding on those doors. And on the one hand, we've got a positive approach saying, actually, we need to argue for really good palliative care. That was happening yesterday in Parliament. But on the other, there's a momentum building towards moving it into a let's look at the data rather than the ethics. Let's consider all the stats and the data. So, you know, the conversations are happening. And why is it a concern? Well, Age UK report that by 2040, disabled adults in the UK, older people, sorry, so not just adults, older people will increase 67 percent. So it's really important how we're considering our choices and responses as churches now um, and how we react to this uh, rhetoric that's out there around ageing um, that will impact the future and how the future looks for older people. And, you know, this mindset, perhaps staying away from ageism, but this mindset of feeling like I have no value isn't just solely limited to those who are dependent on care for support. So in the befriending service, part of our assessment that we do uh, when we do face-to-face -face assessments, everything's been over the phone, so we've limited some of the detail that we've gone into, but we would ask people as part of that, um, how valued do you feel? And, you know, people can answer quite positively to all sorts of other questions, but it's fascinating what it uncovers to ask somebody that and the impact that loneliness and that lack of relationship does on a person's sense of worth. And often the only appropriate response has been just to reach out, grab a hand, and just say, we think you are valuable, we think you're precious, we think your life is absolutely of worth. And so can, keeping with the why and thinking biblically, we can move to the next slide. It's just a whistle stop tour of some scriptures, but just to give you a hint really of why we feel this is absolutely a biblical response. We only have to open the first few pages of scripture, don't we? Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. There is the picture of a Trinitarian God that we worship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who is community, who is relationship, creating us in his likeness. Do you realise the intrinsic value that places on every human life, regardless of age or stage? And I was listening to Tim Keller the other day, and he was saying God's given, like, created us with this design deficit to actually need the other to need community, to need those around us. You know, it was the only thing he said wasn't good, wasn't it, in the whole of creation. And we see God's heart through scripture around those who are on the fringes, those who are on the edges of society. Father to the fatherless, Psalm 68 says, um, you know, protector of widows, God places the lonely in families. And that family is about his people, isn't it? He's talking here, this is his redemption story bringing people from the fringes into those warm centers of his people. And we've heard, I'm sure, throughout the last few days, all the verses about honoring and God's, God's like command to honor older people. 
And yet we also hear his anger at the injustice um, that, that when older people are not treated well. So Isaiah 47 talks about you, Babylon, you oppressed even the elderly. You know, it makes a specific point around how mm. they treated the elderly. And so what is our response? Well, we can find it, can't we, within this Micah 6 eight of like, how do we respond? We do justice. We love kindness. We walk humbly with our God. So we're to be distinctive, to be set apart and to be a blessing to our surrounding communities. So how does the church model a counterculture that honors older people, that brings people from those fringes, from the edges into the center and reaffirms the value? Well, I'm gonna basically spend the next um, section of time talking to you about our journey of the last eight years so hopefully some of it will just be springboards into your own context and thinking around it i'm not going to explore deeply what we've done through lockdown because our hope prayer and dream right folks is that we're coming out of this now that we, <laughs> that we will be coming back to face to face so i feel there's been some focus on that in the last few days so i think it's i'm just going to focus on what we were doing prior to and i'm going to start we can move to the next slide when i started as a community worker um, I was put on a little course with the council because they were basically saying, how on earth are we going to have communities going to become uh, flourishing again? How, how are we going to build them back up when the money's not out there? And the approach they used is asset based community development. So basically, what's the community already got? What's good? What's there? What's the potential? How do we release that? And how do we create something that's sustainable? So I want to just use this as kind of our model for exploration in this. And I want to start by actually asking the question, what's in your heart? What's the potential in your heart? What are you carrying? What burdens are you carrying that God's placed on your heart? What perhaps certain areas and what passions do you bring to the table with that? What skills? Who are the others around you who are carrying that heart as well? I think Pippa stressed the importance of team. Yeah, get them around you, get praying together. And you know, our team was just a handful at first. Numbers aren't the thing, you know, just get the people around you, even if it's the one or two. And then I'm gonna move into what, um, in terms of potential with the spaces that we have. So considering our buildings and how we might use them. So if you can move to the next slide. One of the first things that we did was we set up the Motra Monday matinee and it was basically just let's, let's open the space, create a really warm welcome you know, we'll do quizzes and sing-alongs, teas and coffees, cakes. We'll have trips out in the summer. But, you know, we'll have a good knees up with these guys. And it was great. It, it was really good just to form those relationships. Um, and, we, you know, we'd have prayer requests on tables, hymns in the sing-alongs. And often, you know, the team at times would stand up, share the testimony. My own grandma, who's 96, I was thrilled that she wanted to be part of this. She's one of the funniest people I know. And whoever she sits next to, they'd just be absolutely howling the whole time. But she is on hand to share a testimony, that woman. So we've had her up and <laughs> sharing hers. And that's where it's looking for the people that are around you, both within your church. So we've had people come in and do uh, flower arranging sessions and, you know, lead, <clears throat> lead uh, specific talks over something or craft. Um, but also who's coming along and what can you release in them as well to feel like they're contributing and a part of this. So we've had people that come and do, um, you know, lead the quizzes themselves or do talks about local history, et cetera. The, you know, the potential is, is huge really when you start to tap into it. And I'm just gonna reference this chap in the middle with the black cap on, 105 this guy was in November. Awesome chap, yeah, wonderful. Um, okay, uh, if we can move on to the next um, slide. So one of my personal passions is old film. This is there. Uh, you can blame my granddad for this one. And uh, I always had this dream of like having a re retro cinema or something just to bring people together with film. And we got some funding from the local council and basically set up a pop up cinema in the church that we use once a month. And, you know, I just want to promote film as an excellent medium to connect people and connect people of all ages as well. So we found um, a broader mix of ages coming in. So uh, we, we, we would largely have, say, those 75 plus attending our Monday group. But with the films, it could be, you know, anyone post-retirement would maybe join in. Because if you want to see a film, you want to see it. You know, you just come along. We found more men were attracted to that. Nationally speaking, they're the hardest to engage with. 
um, they have ice cream intervals. And then we, what we did is we decided that in summer holidays and school holidays, we'd bring the children in and show a family film. So that middle picture at the top is one of those family films. Now, I'll be honest, some of the films, the old people would be like, I hate this film, it's terrible, the music's too loud. But listening to those kids laugh along to it, how much joy does that bring? And this gentleman in the middle, um, he flew in, as you can see in the top middle, he flew in Operation Manor dropping food parcels into Holland um, after the war. And in the interval, the ice cream interval, these boys, young lads were gathered around him while he's telling these stories. And they ran up to me afterwards and were like, this man's a real life superhero. You know, it kind of blew the mind. So it's building those bridges between generations, finding those connection points. And I'll explore that a little bit more in a bit. If we can move on to the next slide, the other ABCD thing to look for in your community is where are the spaces and where's the need as well? Because we had um, three local care and residential homes with basically unused communal lounges because the social care cuts had actually called all the um, activity coordinators. So we approached them and basically spoke with management and said, look, um, you know, we know you don't know us. They weren't really interested in anything too churchy. I said, but how can we bless this community? How can we bless this space that will be of benefit to the residents? So we started the mobile matinee at that point because it was an open door. It was like, come in and do some activities. So once a month, we'd tour the three homes and do activities in the lounge. And it was great for building relationships, keying people in with what was happening at the church. And also, believe it or not, guess what happens in time? The care home opened up then for us to do church services alongside that. The other, uh, one of the other residential homes opened their door for church services just before um, the lockdown, well, about January before the lockdown. And this picture on the right, on the top right, is actually uh, us using Brain and Soul Boosting for Seniors. That's in the social housing complex. And we actually found that to be a really good tool to take these really well built trusting friendships and now let's explore the gospel together so we kind of use that material as like a type of springboard really to talk gospel with them and we had some wonderful experiences of seeing kind of eyes open to a truth that they'd sort of known from a distant history but kind of come into the forefront again as kind of god started to open eyes to the reality of who he is Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next one and just discuss some of the intergenerational potential because in your community will be primary schools. Now it doesn't take much from primary schools to want to get keyed in with some of the local stuff happening. They're actually already really open to it. It didn't take much from us. It was a conversation to say, could we link up here? Could we do something together? So for 18 months before the lockdown, we were having several children from the primary school come each month and we had these intergenerational sessions and we had, it was learning both ways. So they would uh, learn from the older people about being their age in the war and what that was like. And um, they'd do cooking together and the children would do music sessions with them. The middle picture at the top is them trying to teach our good friend Terry how to do the floss. It's a very energetic move if any of you have seen it and he soon had to sit down because I think he put his hip out, but he, he was still laughing along. Um, and the, the right hand picture is actually another example of someone contributing to the club. This was a lady with dementia. She was diagnosed a couple of years ago and in her work, she was a master seamstress, but had this love of everything craft. And she um, came and, and actually delivered a session for us alongside a daughter. And we all made these like dogs made out of flannels. They were very cute and very lovely and we all enjoyed it. But it was just a joy to see her doing, you know, doing her thing still and, and really seeing the impact of those who were joining in as well. Um, okay, if you move to the next slide. So this is um, an event that we put on once a year. I think having a foot in the youth pool as a youth worker and being a community worker was kind of on those, oh, hang on, maybe we can do more here to bring these together. So early, um, in the early conversations with the older people, what came out was this love of the dance hall days. So we said, you know what, we can do something with that. Let's dress this place to the nines. Let's put a fake dance floor down, go and get your glad rags on and let's have a meal together and have a nice evening together. And we've got a New Orleans jazz bandy. And we do this every year. But what we do is we ask all the children and young people at the church to come and serve at that event in, in the, the shirts and dresses and stuff. 
And you know, it's an absolute privilege and a joy with this event because we, we don't just have the older people that we connect with, we invite local councillors, we have the public health officer coming along just to say, come and have a snapshot because what we want, we want people to see is kingdom culture. We want to say, here's what it looks like when God gets his hand on the story and what's fragmented in society through his people. And what this has done is it's, it's brought a, a, a different understanding of younger people to some of our older as well. So I remember one gentleman pulling me to one side afterwards and saying, you know what? You know what it's shown me this? They're not all like what you read in the newspaper, are they? Because that's for those who don't have grandchildren, that's all they're reading. And we see it with the love that the young people show for the older people. They get excited about this event as much as the older people do as well. So that's just a, just snapshots of just kind of some, some thoughts of how these, this bringing together of generations can look um, through God's people. So if we move on to the next um, slide, what I'd like, how I'd like to discuss befriending in terms of assets is actually the asset of our older people in our churches because 90% of our befrienders are post-retirement. In fact, there's, we've got an 80, I think it's 86, who is ringing four people every week. He's an absolute legend. And you know, I love what Henry Nguyen says. Ian Nguyen, he says, older people are like desert guides. They've been through the dry places and they make excellent guides to lead people to water. And before lockdown, this was, of course, face to face. But in the lockdown, we had to move that to telephone support. And we went from five partnerships with churches locally to 12. But we went out there a bit more offering prayer on our posters as well for those who would like it. So we'll phone. And if you would like, we're happy to pray. We've had an 80 percent uptake of those who want prayer as part of these phone calls. There is a hunger out there not just for connection, there's a spiritual hunger out there for hope. And do we not carry the hope of Christ? Is this not a time for God's people to be out there being those hope bearers? And encouragingly, you know, we've had some who have since started attending church as they've reopened, who haven't been church before. And we've got others saying, actually, I want to key in the other side of this. So excited about what God's doing there but listen if you've not done befriending and that just kind of scares you the thought of it because it's all the red tape how on earth do we get past that yes there is red tape but the good news is you don't have to reinvent the wheel there are groups out there who are absolutely there to support and equip you to do this we joined the befriending network which I've put on there um, in the lockdown, I'm kicking myself for not joining them sooner. They've got all sorts of free resources at the moment. And if you did pay the membership fee, you'd have a whole whole world of information and resources opened up to you. Linking Lives, of course, are, the, are those that are specifically trying to support churches as well. So that's two, two you can look up if that's something you want to explore. OK, so just put on the next slide, if you would. OK, so another thing. Um, just it's not to do with the ABCD, but I just want to make this point about being there when it counts and in times where it really does hurt. And Christmas Day for someone who's on their own, that's a really unnatural time to be alone. So the last three years, we've used all these links we've made with Silver Cord and out in the community to host a Christmas Day lunch for anyone who would have been on their own. And we've had all ages represented from the church, sitting at tables with people, sharing in that meal with them. And um, I remember, I'll never forget what one lady said to me at the end of it. She just said, you know, that made me feel human again. Like, don't underestimate what this does to the core value of someone. And on the right, you've got one of your volunteers, haven't you? But we put a shot, we thought, well, we can't do this how we have done before in the lockdown. But we actually used all these partner churches and the volunteers. We had to turn them away in the end. We had that many. It was wonderful. Um, but we delivered 90 meals across the borough on Christmas Day. Uh, last year to anyone who wouldn't have had any other face-to-face -face contact so I just felt I want to reference that and just say that the having these other events happening around your church when you do befriending the beauty of it is we're able to connect people straight into community so you can bypass some of the face the the one-on-one -on -one stuff and you can bring people straight in to those warm centers and some have chosen to come straight into the church or straight into a midweek Bible study 
the doors are all open and they choose which ones to come through but we're there and being that warm presence for them okay so moving on to the next slide just in summary then what have we got we've got churches now i need to make that obvious point and say we know churches are not the building churches are the people that's the church but churches have buildings right so let's use them how can we use those spaces and there probably should be a pick of like you know a school and the care residential homes etc what's in your community what are the spaces out there that you can be a blessing and a presence and build relationship and we've got older people praise god for older people probably one of the most untapped resources of the kingdom how can we release older people into ministry and on the front line of mission because they have a role and they have a place that is irreplaceable and then family how wonderful that the church has this most unique it's it's absolutely extraordinary what the church has to offer in terms of family you don't see a demographic like you get in church with such an eclectic group of people coming together do you realize the potential in that and the hunger for that in our communities as people are longing to be connected to family where can we model what that kingdom culture of intergenerational looks like and invite people into those warm centers and then lastly but should never be last it should be around all of it in all of our thinking in all of our hearts we have god <laughs> we're the cracked pots that's what that picture is we're weak we're feeble we're human you know our best efforts what are they without god we have the lord of heaven's arm is on our side we have the holy spirit and truly only he can be the hero in this story only he can be the one who can truly meet that deepest ache in a human heart so we keep him front and center so i'm just going to put my last slide on and just say put simply it's not rocket science it's relationship it's providing that welcome it's being those hope bearers with a heart and it's okay to keep it simple and it's okay to go to absolute town with the things that you do but remember, it's your presence that people want. And yes, we long for eyes to be opened to that deep ache of the heart that only God can fill. But I wonder how many of our testimonies include the story of another Christian getting alongside us. I wonder. And, you know, it's not often in the big events that we uh, put the most energy into that you find some of the golden nuggets. We have a lady uh, at our church who's in her 80s and her thing before the lockdown she had a ministry of hugs and every week she would go around on a monday and ask every single person can i give you a hug and she just she's only a petite little lady she's given this really tight bear hug she wouldn't let him go for a while and you know i went to visit um a, a really good friend of mine who's 92 who was in hospital before lockdown and um it, it was tragic really she was breaking a heart about the state of the care system and i said you know what do you think it needs because she'd said it's this undefeatable monster and you know what she said to me she said you know that woman on a monday who walks around and gives everyone a hug she said i know that's not for everyone but i tell you what a touch of the hand could change everything that's what's needed it's in those small things it's being present i know we can't touch we haven't been able to touch for so long but guys don't miss the potential of being there when it matters as people come out of this what a hug can do of God's people being present in community to reach out and offer that support. Keep Christ central. <laughs> John 15, you know, never lose that out of your mind. Abide in me and you'll provide much fruit. And we can get so fixated on fruit looking like numbers. That's how we can interpret what success looks like. You know, I've been really challenged constantly over the years never to make numbers a big thing. And I'll tell you, just honestly, when I said, oh, yeah, and more men came to our cinema. In fact, we increased 100 percent. But you know what that meant? We went from two to four men. OK, so I <laughs> just want to give you some perspective on that. In some of the churches we're partnered with, we only have one befriender. But, you know, God's constantly said to me that Gideon 300 story. He realized what I can do with the ones that I choose, with what I have with a little. It's OK. What matters to him is a heart that's absolutely captivated with him and obedience. Keep prayer hot, 
there's any more needs to be said it's just that isn't it keep pounding the doors of heaven for god to do what only he can do and have fun because it is it's a total total privilege and um, bittersweet at times but you know there's a world out there that really really does need the church at this time so let's be distinctive let's be a blessing and um, and you know I, I start i had psalm 68 at the start and you know if you carry on in psalm 68 it says the lord brings the word and a great army brings the good news and i was reading a spurgeon commentary and he said uh, ready as they were to chant the victory they were equally swift to publish the fact the battle note had been sounded Oh, for the like zeal in the church of today, that when the gospel is published, both men and women may eagerly spread the glad tidings of great joy. We've got great joy to spread out there in a world that is hurting and to a people group who for the large part are marginalized and feeling undervalued. Let's go out there. We're cheering you on and praying for you. Pray for us. Let's, be, let's rise to the challenge. Let's rise to the battle. Let's keep him as victor. Um, and let's have fun in the process. <laughs> so that's, I'm going to wrap it up there. I've probably gone on too long. Sorry for that. Um, but that's my email. I know I rented off a few statistics and the rest. Please feel free to get in touch afterwards if you want me to share where any of that information or want more info about what we're doing. And I'm going to hand back to Carl. Now. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, <clears throat> just not to add anything to what Deb has said, but just to thank Deb for her, uh, just everything that she brings. It's a privilege working with her in terms of our partnership support with Faith and Age Life. And all I really wanted to say is, uh, before we go to Q&A and then James wraps up as we come to the end of the week, is that at Faith and Age Life, we currently uh, have a church champion community around 400 churches across the UK, where we are getting together regularly uh, with people like Deb's and others, you know, people who might be volunteering on their own. It's one person, they meet an old person every week, or they might be running a befriending service, whichever it might be. We want to bring all of these uh, wonderful people like you together. Um, and so do join our community. It's a, it's a really blunt call to action. Uh, to do so, we can support you with resources. Uh, we can engage you in, with people like Debs, you know, so we can hear that best practice. Um, because we love working in partnership in the gospel uh, and uh, building up uh, this momentum behind uh, what the Lord wants to do with and through older people. Uh, there's a link in the chat, which I'm going to put now. Uh, do have a look a bit later at our website, um, because it's wonderful having Debs as one of our church champions as we journey together with her. And so that's all I wanted to add on there. So I hope that's OK. And um, James, over to you. <laughs>